welcome to yet another episode of spill your mind and i want to thank each and every one of you to for clicking and uh, again starting starting to watch this podcast and uh, you know i won't take too much time because we have a very special and wonderful guest today uh, but before we start i want to uh, again i i have to i think i have to start saying this at some point now uh, but if you're already on the channel but and if you're not subscribed yet consider doing it if you enjoy the content over here uh because it helps me to to understand that there is an audience for this so that you know i can keep uh moving on with this so thank you for the, for that and uh today i brought on a special guest his name is frank lobo and uh, he is a freelance writer and the founder of project 52 and uh, there's a lot of interesting things that we can talk about so i think we should just get right into it but before we get into it Uh, is there anything that you want to tell the audience frank yeah um, nothing to the audience specifically yet but uh, to you thank you for having me on and uh, i'm looking forward to this conversation perfect all right uh, i've mentioned that you're the founder of project 52 so it makes sense to start off with that uh, let me know cuz every time i think about it uh, it it some somehow boggles my mind so let me know why you started project 52 why do you think it was relevant to start in the first place yeah uh, so project 52 is a system for habit tracking and habit building uh, 52 stands for 52 weeks in a year so on uh, may 7th or rather the week of may 7th uh, 2020 i decided that you know I'm, uh, may 7th is my birthday and uh, in 2020 i decided i'm going to make this birthday significant and what i decided is in fact uh, that i'm going to start habit tracking uh, so i selected a bunch of habits and i said i'm going to track them i'm going to score myself every week on them and i did that for one year uh, then in 2020 you know 2021 this year uh, again uh, i realized hey i can just continue to do this i can uh, select a different set of habits because the first set of habits had become kind of natural and automatic to me so i can select a new set of habits and i can do the same thing again so i selected the next set of habits um, and uh, i did that but then as i was doing that my brother a friends a couple of my friends couple of my brothers friends and you know a couple of uh, people you know just people around they got curious about it they were like hey um, you seem to be doing something interesting with this habit building thing can we also do it uh, can we also use the system uh, that you are using so that's why i created uh, uh, you know a template for anybody who wants to start habit building with project 52 and uh, you also got on board eventually so steve uh, and uh, yeah that's that's uh, that's how it uh, um, you know unfolded i suppose um, but if you want context for it uh, there is a lot of context i can give i can go back even 10 years i don't want to do that right off the bat uh, all i'll say is that uh, uh before i started project 52 i started with something much simpler i called it project cmib conquer my inner bitch <laughs> and uh, the goal of this project was to um you know conquer my inner bitch which is you know this nagging voice inside saying hey you can't do it you can't do it you can't do it you are too lazy whatever that 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 bitch right that's there at all of us i wanted to conquer that and uh, well uh, project cmib was very simple my goal was to run uh, up to 2 kilometers every day uh, for i think 134 days or something like that and i that, that i had to do achieve those 134 days before my birthday in may 2020 so there was a, like a, so that was my first habit tracking for just for one habit running consistently do that every day um yeah that was the prototype of project 52 when i uh, project 52 itself started i had uh, many more habits that i had put together and uh, what what is it that you know the people ask what is it that brings all those habits together it's the intention so you can have an intention for a project 52 for one year this is my intention for so for example for me my first year intention was i want to set a foundation for physical mental and spiritual well being and um, yeah that was my intention for the sec- first year the second year i have set a different intention and the, you know you can that's how you select your habits as well based on your intention right uh you've mentioned that uh, the first iteration of project 52 was conquer your inner bitch and uh, it's interesting to know understand because we we all have that uh, nagging part of ourselves uh, as from from the time when we hit like maybe 17 20 uh, 17 18 for me at least and uh, from then onwards there's there's a constant uh, 
voice of self doubt within you uh maybe i guess challenging you that you can't do a particular thing and maybe you can do his particular things but it's it's always there in you mostly hindering you from doing what you have to do next why do you mm. think that is there uh, in every person or do you think do you think it's 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 a thing that we grow up because of our i mean surroundings or because of the media that we are influenced to or is it innately part of being human is it uh, innately part of being human to have this voice telling you that you cannot do it that you you know that you're not good enough um well it seems to be most people seem to have that voice um you know that uh sort of feeling that you're not good enough feeling that you're not uh, worthy you know i think it is uh, a, a a part of being human yes but it's also a part of being human to to get over that uh, voice and to uh, create a to to find your own voice because really i don't think that is your voice you know that uh, disempowering voice i don't think that is your voice i think that is the voice of uh, you know whatever spirit or entity or whatever you want to call it that is really um, there to just sabotage you and uh, you know and uh, destroy you i think that is what that is what where that voice comes from uh, your voice is not that voice and i think you the the journey that every human being has to go through is finding your own voice right mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, for me it was about that it, i think that uh, the the whole journey has been about finding my voice and uh, learning to use my voice right um, okay. and i think it is normal to have that challenge when you're first coming you know uh, when you're taking those first few steps that to have that uh, voice telling you that you cannot do it then eventually you have to you have to learn to tackle that voice you have to learn to deal with it you have to learn to you know basically get it out of the way and uh, uh, finally find your own voice and then use your own voice i think that is the journey that we all have to go through it and do you would you consider yourself as a fiercely optimist optimistic person in general yes 100% yes i'm fiercely optimistic yes so if that's the case like you were you were talking about like you know finding everyone has a a true voice of their own and then there's also a distorted voice that's kind of formed because of the surrounding that you're in so do you believe that everyone's uh, that the, each person's distinct original voice is also fiercely optimistic or is it possible for a person to have a pessimistic voice hmm um see i don't think uh, uh i don't think pessimism is wrong uh, in any way because it depends on context so when you ask me if i'm an optimist obviously the, my answer is contextual saying that uh, in what context am i optimistic so generally i would say yes in the largest context possible i am very optimistic in specific individual context i might be pessimistic so uh, being pessimistic is not a bad thing i think uh, but, but but i do think that being cynical is a bad thing like sort of giving up on humanity is not a good thing because i, I think it it is contradictory to the facts like if you look at uh, uh, despite the way the world is right now and it's fashionable to be cynical these days but uh, i think uh, that you know being optimistic is um being optimistic is something that is people have people anybody who has achieved anything at all has been an optimist let me put it that way right if you're not an optimist you will not be able to get anywhere in life and it, more importantly you will not be able to take anybody anywhere in life if you want to forget about doing good for yourself if you want to do good for your family your your community your society whatever it is right um if you want to at least do that you need to be an optimist i don't know if i answered your question uh, right so i i'm guessing i'm me. guessing what what you're saying is yeah i mean i even i totally agree with that uh, point of view but it's just like i'm not i'm not sure because i was watching uh, the movie joker and obviously in that joker is he's also a cynical uh, cyn- is it a cynical cynicist i guess what is it yes. he's a cynical he's a cynical person ah, he's a cynical say. person but he's and, also uh, i think the uh, word you're looking for is uh, cynic he's a cynic yes yeah, c- he's a cynic right he's a cynic yeah. at heart but and and he's also comes under the purview of a pessimist uh, but i guess right. the rationale behind his mindset although although very destructive in nature he finds a true peace in his chaos so as to speak and uh, i guess the general 
a general overview of every person in this world right i'm guessing like if, if like successful businessmen people who've done something with their lives so as to speak uh they are defaulted towards optimism because uh the the outcome that they're looking for is to make something out of life to help people in life right but if you go to joker's perspective he doesn't have any of those uh, things in mind his he finds true peace in chaos and he doesn't feel uh, anything wrong so, he doesn't yeah yeah go on yeah i don't know about joker finding peace i think the whole point of joker is that he is always troubled and he always will be troubled i don't think the the, the joker ever finds peace in in anything uh, you know if he found peace he wouldn't be the he wouldn't be the joker right he he is inherently you know uh, troubled he is inherently uh, you know in a state of uh, uh destructive chaos because see chaos is also a tricky word i don't think chaos inherently is bad either chaos can be very useful chaos can be very productive uh in fact too much order can be a bad thing right mm. so it's not about chaos and order but more about whether it's constructive or destructive and uh, i think fundamentally uh, uh you know the the fact is that joker or a character like joker tends towards the destructive right what some people just want to watch the world burn that's the idea that's what alfred says right to batman the, yeah. the you know there are of course out there people who just want to watch the world burn because mostly it's because they themselves have been hurt and fact is you know what at times in my own life i wanted to watch the world burn right i wanted to tear everything down i wanted to nuke the whole world whatever right all those feelings of resentment and anger is something i think many people feel and um, ultimately um, we can and the thing is you can even act on it right you can choose you know what i'm going to dedicate my life to actually uh, actually develop these feelings of resentment and build on these feelings of resentment that is a choice that you have and um, i it's just a question of whether you're going to choose that or whether you're going to choose to uh um, cultivate gratitude cultivate appreciation and uh, uh choose to see the good things in life and uh, build on those things rather than the and 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 actually be constructive rather than destructive right i mean uh, this is a side note to the audience because i was talking about joker something that i have uh, some a problem that i have or a criti- criticism that i have about the movie is that there is an oh, it's it's overly glorified to be chaotic in nature and it's almost portrayed as a, a heroic act it could be you never know uh because we generally are not framed to think in that perspective uh but uh, as far as i understand uh, there is <laughs> there is no benefit as such in being as chaotic as joker so uh, to overly glorify that uh, mindset is uh, somewhat troubling but still yet a very interesting piece of artwork in my opinion uh but let's go back let's uh, dial a little back we we've, we've gone uh, we we've, we've derailed from the topic talking about project 52 and uh, you've done it for around 2 years i'm i'm guessing i'm in like 15 16 weeks in uh but and i still have like long way to go but since you've been 2 years into project 52 i'm sure you've already understood the uh the flaws and the merits of the system as such so how how has it worked for you and uh, what do you think uh how do you think the average person will benefit from this right um so the first thing that people need to understand is uh, if you want to build habits at all you need to have a context in which to build them and this is something that even i realized a bit late because it for me it wasn't really relevant because rather it was uh it was uh, just one context so for example uh i started my project 52 in at home when i was at home and in lockdown so basically i i for at least for that one year i had just one context like i did not move to a new place or there was no major changes in my life but what i noticed is when other people started project 52 if there was some shift in their life so for example with the students if they were in college they had a certain context a certain set of habits but when the exams got over and they had vacation they had a different context and a different set of habits so uh, project 52 needs to have a certain uh, uh, flexibility in terms of the habits as well so that's something that i kind of missed out on initially because i did not take into uh, uh, account that people's habits can radically change you know in a given in those 52 weeks itself um th- that is one thing to keep in mind and uh, you know if you want to start project 52 it would help to have let's say one context in which you want to execute it so for example uh, a lot of people uh, you know uh, 
they, they will start project they can uh, recently one guy started project 52 just when he started a new job okay and he moved, he moved to a new place he started a new job so it's like okay now this is my new context so might as well build momentum right from the start uh, but if you're going to have some major changes coming up in the next few weeks or months uh, then it is also ready to uh, it's good to be prepared for those changes because you know that your habits will go for a toss anyway when when those major changes come into place um I think that is the first, that is the biggest thing I've realized off late, which is to key, context is key. Like you need to understand people's context if you're um, if you're going to be, or, or, and for that matter, your own context. If you're going to be habit building, you need to understand your own context. Right. Uh, obviously, if you re okay, so uh, this is a more context. I I've I've been reading a lot of Frank's writings, which is which he posts con consistently on his uh, Substack page. And I'll leave I'll leave all the description like uh, the links to his uh, works in the description below. So anyone that's watching, you can take time to read and understand where Frank is coming from and all the things that I'm talking about. It's all there uh, in the I guess the links that I'm providing there. So uh, one of the pieces that you wrote about is about the game of life, and uh, the pro project fifty two comes under your entire general theme of the game of life and you often talk about project 52 not as a system but rather as a game that you play on a day-to-day -day basis uh why is this why do you see life as such as a game and uh yeah go on yeah um i'll start off with a quick story um so recently a friend of mine and i had uh, uh gone to the beach and uh he just uh, we were having a pretty intense conversation and uh, he just uh, he just looked at he just pointed at just generally you know he's like what the hell is going on man like what the hell is going on and he was talking about just life in general because you know if you just take a second you know we are sitting on a tiny blue rock out in the middle of nowhere rotating around a giant nuclear reactor which is the sun uh, in you know in one corner of the milky way galaxy which is one among trillions of galaxies in an in a universe of which we don't even know how big it is right so he was just like what the hell is going on where are we what the hell is going on right you know and uh, i think this is really the this, this is really what it comes down to because you know up until our parents generation uh, most people were religious and they had a very concrete understanding of let's say uh, this is life this is what it's about and this is the story that we tell about what is what is going on right uh, but with our generation with the dawn of the internet what happened is that our consciousness was ripped open forcibly which is to say we got so much information about what is actually out there and what is where we are and what's going on that this information itself was like a sort of i could say you could say that you know um, it was uh, it was a traumatic uh, in instance of us being forced to see the truth. It's like that uh, Bird Box movie. I don't know if you watched it with Julia Roberts, I think, where, uh, you know, the whole thing is that, you know, there are these guys who are forcing people to see this particular thing, which we don't know what it is, the mysterious entity. But the internet is kind of that. It has forced us to kind of open our eyes and see everything. And I think we are in trauma because of what we have seen and what we have heard and what we have learned, right? And um, the reason, uh, uh, and I think that it is not possible to really uh, make sense of the universe with logic, not logic alone, rather. I'm not saying logic is a bad thing, but I don't think it can help us make sense of the universe. And I think that the best way to look at the universe or to understand life is through uh, poetry, through stories, and through art, or through songs, or through, I think, but the best one is video games, because you might have heard uh, it being said, you know, that uh, Elon Musk is famous for putting this idea forward that the universe seems to be some kind of simulation. So what's this difference between a simulation and a video game? Because essentially they're the same thing, except in a video game, you actually have control over the simulation. Mm. Right. So what, when you're when you're in a simulation, you can play in the simulation, then it becomes a video game. And I think the universe is kind of like that. I think it's like a video game. Um, and uh, we are all, you know, we are all we are all called to play. Right. And in fact, that is why kids, when we're a little bit, when we're a little bitty, you know, infants, we love to play. When we're kids, we love to play. And not just us, like all animal species, every, everybody, everybody plays. Right. Um, but in, when we grow up, I think that uh, we, we, most, many of us lo tend to lose that playfulness. And I think it's important to bring back, back that playfulness if we are to survive the next few decades, because uh, I think that playfulness, ironically, will help us deal, deal with certain very serious situations that will come up in the next few decades, everything from climate change to AI or whatever it is, right? All the big challenges that are ahead of us, 
uh, I think it it will help us uh, deal with uh, that. And that is why I think the idea of the game of life is so important because uh, we need to start. Uh, we need to make play great again. <laughs> that's the yeah. idea. Yeah. I mean, uh, something that's part of every game, and not every game is such. Probably a games that I've played is that there are glitches within games. And uh, what is a glitch in this real life game of the world that we live in? What does it look like? A glitch in the game, a glitch in the matrix. Um, well, I think the biggest uh, because see, if you see when you say glitch, do you mean a mistake? Or I mean, you, I guess say- yeah. Uh, I mean, you never you it's, you can interpret it like the glitch in the matrix. You can interpret it as a, in a million ways, right? I'm guessing yeah. You can say it's a mistake. Right. I think um, I think uh, no. So a uh, uh, glitch in the matrix. So you know, if you remember, I think in the movie, the matrix, the glitch in the matrix was. I think it was a cat that was uh, you know passing by again and again. I think that was the glitch in the matrix, right? Yeah. But I think in uh, in in real life, what what you would call uh, glitches, uh, then although I wouldn't call them that, is uh, uh, you know, but it fits the bill. It's uh, what you would call ser- serendipity. Serendipity is when uh, is something that I've experienced multiple times in life, which is something where you know it feels like the universe is aligning in a certain way, right? So uh, you know, uh, th- how do I describe it? Okay, so I'll give you one example. Uh, I was reading, I believe, uh, yes, I was reading uh, Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and uh, there was one page or one one particular section where he talks about a meeting of uh, deaf and dumb people. Okay, and I'm sitting in Cabin Park in Bangalore, and and I'm reading this page, or I'm just sitting in this gazebo, and I'm reading this page, and you know it's about deaf and dumb people, and there's some I don't recall the exact story, but I'm look and I look in front of me, and there's literally a meeting of deaf and dumb people right happening right in front of me, that is like you know that kind of coincidence, that is yeah. that is what you would call uh, serendipitous, right? So yeah. it's basically very meaningful coincidences. So that is just one uh, a, a slightly silly or rather slightly trivial example, honestly, because I've had uh, you know serendipitous moments that have basically made me look around in may, almost made me feel creeped out because it feels like my life is scripted and I'm just acting it out. It almost right. feels like it's a movie, right? Right. Uh, right. So I think uh, that would be that would be a glitch in the matrix when you start to suddenly see through the. You know, normal waking reality that we're used to, and you start wonder if there is something. There's like a larger game at uh, a foot. Let's say, yeah. Right. Uh, you somehow uh, somewhere during the entire uh, talk, you mentioned that uh, spirituality was one of your intentions that you've set in place when you started Project Fifty Two. But when you look around, it seems as though our current generation and the generations that come after us seem to have a sort of uh, spiritual crisis. Uh, to say the least, uh, and it might, it may or may not be a spiritual crisis, but there's definitely a crisis of some sort. Uh, there's a crisis for hope. There's a crisis for a crisis to look for the good in tomorrow. Why do you think there is a there is such a crisis, and do you think spirit, uh, spirituality fills this gap? Yeah, uh, I definitely think there is a spiritual crisis. In fact, I think uh, the spiritual crisis is uh, more significant than the mental health crisis. In fact, I think that. A lot of the mental health crisis is actually spiritual health crisis, and uh, what what do I, what do you mean by that? What do we mean by spirit first of all? Because spirit is a very vague term; it's not very well defined, right? So, what do we mean by spirit? Let's let's talk about that first. So, um, spirit can so let let's uh, draw an interesting parallel. So, there's something called wines and spirits, right? So, when you drink alcohol, you know you're essentially drinking spirits, right? So, why do you feel in high spirits, right? That's what they say, high spirited. Right, which means you are you're enthusiastic, you're lively, right? So that's what happens when you drink spirits, right? I think that there is a parallel between the literal alcohol spirits and this being in good spirits, right? Are you in good? You know, so I ask you, for example, are you in good spirits? How are you? Are you in good spirits? Uh, that would also imply, you know, that uh, there is something called spirit, okay, which is let's say your uh, levels of enthusiasm for life. That your levels of joy and bliss and ecstasy within yourself, right? Energy, and they, that energy, can go, yes, as such. energy, yes, of course. And that can go up and down, right? So that would be your, sp- your, your spirit, right? And uh, so now the next question is, where do you get that from? Right? So you can say, yes, first of all, you need to have 
you know, generally you need to have, uh, you need to feel safe. I think that would be one of the most important things. If you don't feel safe, you don't, you're not going to be, have, have a lot of energy because you're constantly looking for threat, threat, threat. Like you're always looking for danger, right? So you'll not be very, uh, you know, en enthusiastic or en full of energy. energy. First, I think, yeah, first thing is safety, I think. Second thing is obviously your basic necessities like food, water, shelter. Shelter, which is again, all, more or less related to safety again. Um, and I think then obviously comes, you need to have, uh, you know, a, a social structure, which is people that you can talk to, a family, friends, you need to have all of that. Um, I think when you have all of that, you know, you, your, your spirit levels go higher and higher. And then I think you, if you have uh, opportunities to, to be of service and contribute, I think your, spirit, your spiritual health will be wonderful, right? So now here, here's the thing. Um, so then, then, you, then you have to ask as to why is it that, uh, you know, um, why is it that many people are having a spiritual crisis today? Uh, well, well, one thing is that obviously, one, the most obvious thing is that community is breaking down. Right. So uh, we spoke earlier how, you know, more and more people are questioning their faith in uh, religion. And as a result of that, uh, they are losing not just their faith, but also their community, their sense of belonging and also their sense of safety. Because when you lose your community, you also lose your sense of safety. So as a result, you're having essentially uh, this is something that I've experienced where I question my own faith in uh, growing up in uh, a Christian family. I question my faith in uh, Christianity and since then, for a very long time, my body was literally in fight or flight mode because I don't. I felt like there was no tribe to keep me safe, right? So yeah, um, I think uh, these are all uh, important things to consider. So uh, if there is a solution for the spiritual crisis, I think it's to create safety. I think it's to create a sense of like a visceral sense of safety for people. Um, uh, and how to do that at scale, I don't know. I know I can talk about how to do it on a one-to-one -on -one basis. The uh, question is, how do we do it at scale? That's a, I think that's a very interesting question to look into. Right. And uh, coming back to communities, especially when you're talking about spiritual communities, obviously there are different types of communities. A business organization is a type of community. But it doesn't necessarily translate to your spiritual well-being, I feel like. So a core... Yeah. Yeah, a core, uh, uh, I guess, part of a spiritual community as such is that the community looks up to uh, the unknown, right? You may call the unknown a god. You may call the unknown the universe. You may some people even call the unknown the brain because they can't decode the brain. Uh, but uh, it the, the common theme is the unknown. They look up to the unknown. They worship the unknown. Uh, and obviously it is a greater being above the people in the community. And so it makes them feel safe because the unknown will provide for them. The unknown will take care of them and things of that sort. Now, because traditional religion is slowly breaking apart in the sense, because, because of science, because science in a sense has, has stripped hope and meaning away from men uh, because it has uh, brutally undermined the spiritual aspect or the meaningful aspect in these stories in these incidents that's happened back in time and they've just brought i mean yes like broken it down to just mere tangible facts yeah reductionism they, they, what you're talking about is reductionism but i i would like to just interject and kind of uh, uh, you know disagree slightly here because the fact is that many of the most famous scientists were deeply religious and even spiritual mm -hmm. And, okay. and I don't mean that in a trivial way because, uh, you know, he, for example, Einstein believed that Buddhism is a religion of the future. Now, again, that is, uh, you know, Buddhists don't necessarily believe in like, a, 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 like they're not deists. They don't believe in a God in that sense. Uh, but he believed something like Buddhism had a lot of, uh, you know, a promise and potential in the future. But for that matter, a lot of scientists have actually uh, understood that, you know, uh, the, the, the material realm is just one realm. In fact, uh, the fundamental reality might not be material at all, right? It might be, um, in fact, there's a beautiful uh, um, Carl Sagan quote, which is to say that the beauty of a living thing does not uh, uh, lie in the atoms that go into making them. It's in the way those atoms are put together. Right? So what he's saying is that it's not the individual parts that make up that, that where we find beauty. It's in the way those different parts work together. It can be, you know, applied, that quote can be applied to our own bodies. It can be applied to the world around us. It can be applied to everything. 
so i think the we need to appreciate more and more not the you know individual aspects of everything but the way all those individual things work together and you know form a whole and you know that is what we need to look at okay okay uh, i mean so i was just like with the other point with uh, i guess science reducing spiritual concepts to just mere tangible uh, i guess repeatable patterns uh, obviously uh, when you say science uh, scientists are also religious i don't mean to say that uh, science are only uh, religious people in a traditional sense i was reading the book i've been reading a uh, currently reading book called uh, the denial of death by ernest baker and in in uh, the beginning parts of the book he mentions that uh, especially america america no matter how much they deny uh, that their community or their yeah the community is religious in nature no matter how much science and money and business they bring into their community and claim that this is a secular world uh, the truth of the matter is that they are a different sort of religion they are not religious yeah. in the in the traditional sense but they also have the common aspects of every religion so in this sense scientists also go into the lab most scientists also i feel like go into the lab with that deep religious uh, fundamentals uh, and also this might or may not affect their work but in the most sense i feel like the work the tools that they set in the scientific tools that are set in place is is such that it strips the meaning away and the meaning has no relevance in the i guess the uh, answer to the question that they're uh, looking for so i guess what my question would again uh, come down to is if if the current world which is highly scientific which is highly tangible they're looking for tangible results right in such a world how do you how do you create a, a, a system that calls to the unknown that i guess reveres the unknown in a sense uh, it's it's almost impossible in my not impossible it's very hard to create such a uh, such a community that that looks forward to the deepest spiritual uh, part of themselves in that nature yeah the, the first thing uh, first thing that we need to consider is that both the, both those things go together the things that can be measured and the things that cannot be measured they go together they are not in a separate universe right they live in the same universe so i don't think you need to have a community that's based on just one right uh, in fact uh, you know uh, uh, pretty much any community uh, but just a side note earlier you had uh, you had said you know business also is like a community i think there's a distinction to be made between organizations and communities right so organizations are they have a structure but not all organizations are are communities but all communities need to have organization they need to be organized right so uh, having said that um, you know i think that when you're talking about uh, so, sorry but what what was the question again if you uh, yeah, the, that you had the in question, mind the question was how how are you able to create a community that right, again, right. yeah yeah um, if you had to community create a community that uh, uh, valued uh, or rather community that uh, is aligned with the higher ideals which are not measurable let's say um, i think that is possible uh, it's uh, I, but i don't know how that can be done at scale uh, i don't know yet how that can be done at scale in the 21st century because i think firstly there's a lot of uh, uh, on one hand all the traditional communities they are all on the decline right that is the data shows that they are all uh, on the decline um, and uh, secondly uh, even if they weren't on the decline they are not equipped to solve the challenges that we are facing in the 21st century if we had to create new communities that are will be able to face up to those challenges uh, we have still not uh, you know i think there are people attempting it out there uh, you know jamie wheel and uh, there's this book called recaps of the rapture that's worth looking into where he specifically talks about uh, he contrasts you know um, these um, uh, these communities these religious traditional communities those, those were actually uh, waiting for the end of the world right versus uh, uh on on the other hand you have silicon valley uh, communities let's say uh, which are also waiting for the end of the world but in a different way right they are, they believe that there'll be a singularity and that you know uh, there'll be basically what you would call techno utopians right they believe that we can create paradise on not using technology but i don't think you know and essentially argues in that book that it's not that simple because everybody is looking to save their, themselves and not uh, they're not taking an all you know uh, they're not really looking out for the whole uh, whole of whole of humanity or even for that matter the whole world right and i think what we really need is some approach that takes into account the whole world mm. and uh, that is that is where the real challenge is right 
something that I say, uh, you, you see, if you look on Frank's screen, you see a lot of things pasted behind on his wall. And uh, one of the things that you, I'm not sure if you can, the audience can notice this, but one of the things it's paradise engineering. And uh, since I've talked to Frank, I know that this is the overarching goal of uh, his venture if some, in some sorts. So explain to the people, what is paradise engineering and how do you think you can achieve it? Yeah, um, I think, uh, in fact, it's good, interesting that you're asking this question. I've been thinking really that I need to put together some kind of master plan for uh, paradise engineering because it's really my like really long-term goal. Uh, I'm, I know that I have to get there and I'm, I know that I'm moving in that direction. I, I'm still very unclear about really you know i think uh, in the next one month or so i should have a lot of clarity because i have a very strong intention to get that clarity um i'll just tell you what i know uh, now or at least the clarity that i have now um fundamentally my thought is this um i think if we can maximize the uh, you know let's say the the bliss and the uh, happiness of every single human being okay and if you add or uh, not just and uh, not just human being but every single living being and if you add all that up, you essentially get paradise, right? Which is, you, if you say every living being is bliss in a state of bliss, that is that would be heaven, right? And I think that is wor worth aiming at. Hmm. That is what paradise engineering is really about. And uh, I, I mean, I, you already mentioned that you are still figuring it out. But uh, yeah. I'm curious, you know, do you deeply believe that in this chaotic world of paradise, engineering a paradise is possible? I think it's almost inevitable. Uh, I think that is the general uh, uh, tendency. It's the overarching uh, direction in which life seems to be moving, right? Um, as an optimist, as a you know, radical optimist, I would say that that's... Uh, it doesn't mean you know that there's any shortcuts there i think uh, you know many people have said let's create heaven or not let's create utopia but the, the problem is that we take short try to take a shortcut there the, you can't if you take the shortcut you will not get there you need to go through what you need to go through in order to get there and i think uh, you know we have gone through quite a lot already and i think uh, we have got some way to go but i think uh, you know we are moving in that direction of uh, actually creating heaven on earth and that is what i I'm aiming at myself and I'm sure that there's a lot of other people out there too who are, you know, aiming at exactly that. Um, and a lot of people are willing to take the, uh, not, you know, they're not going to take shortcuts. They're going to do, do what it takes to get there. Right. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, had a dilemma with Christianity. And then once you were off it, you had around like a 10 year gap of some sort of crisis, right? When you were in flight or fight mode and uh, you were still figuring things out now that you somehow uh i'm not somehow you've you've dug yourself out of that hole and you've somehow made sense of the reality that you're in uh now that you look back into your 20s what do you think is the most sensible way that you could have lived your 20s uh you know if you could repeat the entire cycle how would you live your 20s no now? uh no i would i would uh make encourage myself to uh you know, make all the mistakes that I've made. I, I wouldn't give my, if I had to go back, I would not give an, uh, I would not give advice. I would just say, hey, you're going to be okay. Just go through whatever the fuck you have to go through. Okay, right? perfect. So because, if, it, yeah. if, if you were not going, okay, I, I understand. Like, because obviously the yeah. mistakes are the, the shortcomings that you've gone through make the person that you are. But yeah. for the audience, if there's a 20 year old that's listening, because I'm also currently in my 20, right. 20s, right? right. I, I've been thinking about this quite often. Like what, uh, how do I live the most yeah. sensible twenties of my life? Yeah, and I think you should not live the most sensible twenties. You, your your twenties are when you can be the most like you can make all the stupid mistakes, you can do the, all the stupid things, but like smart stupid, not just any stupid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you need to. You need, this is the time when you can take risks. This is the time when you can go explore. Uh, this is the time when you can really you know uh, jump around, fool around, do whatever you want. The idea is to really uh, get a taste of, see, because just to, if I had to just count off the, the things that I, I have been exposed to in my 20s, uh, there is, uh, well, uh, the hacker maker space, which is the maker community in Bangalore, uh, esports in Bangalore, again, uh, a brief stint with a magician, 
uh, 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 you know, uh, sometimes spent on like a farm on which they were, we were ha- we had hydroponics and uh, you know some startups working together and uh, things like that. So you know, which is which is really uh, not uh, you know things that uh, most people would encounter in in a normal career, let's say. So um, the, the idea is to really and and yeah, fifth thing would be I spent some time in an ashram in Gujarat. So these are things that uh, you know do weird things, do odd things, and uh, you know put yourself out there in like some you know you know you know strange way in uh, and don't do things that you know are predictable and boring. <laughs> you know live an interesting life in your twenties because if you do that, you know your thirties uh, can be really incredible. I think and I, and I'm 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 29 right now and I know that my thirties will be incredible just because of what I have built up so far. All the um, the foundation that I've built up so far, and I know that I can build something solid on this right now. Right, right. Uh, I see a mask <laughs> on your. Yeah, that's. Uh, on your yeah, wall. that's what, just what is there. that about? The, I, that's just that. That's uh, there's no significance to it. I just thought it was cool. It was just lying around, and uh, I thought, hey, why not just put this up here? And there's no intention behind there it. There is but, no intention. But, okay, okay. No, it's just I just thought it's cool. Yeah. All right. You can ask right. me anything about any of the. Uh, anything that you want to talk about in the background because these are all really the most uh, significant uh, you know uh, things in my life and i feel like you know it was important to have so this is my workstation right behind me so i'm literally looking at this all the time i thought like you know um, if it's right in front of me and i'm you know whether consciously or subconsciously it's just constant you know it's constantly going into my visual uh, space so i think it's a good way to prime myself to focus on these things all the time so that's yeah, why i, mean- I put it up there I've known you for some time now, and obviously the audience, just by the looks of it, it seems that you've given a lot of thought into engineering your day to days. Obviously, uh, Project Fifty Two is also a tool that helps you engineer your day to day. Now, thinking about that, what do you think is? Uh, and obviously, because because you've given so much thought, I'm I'm assuming that uh, you've read a lot of books that help you. Uh, get that sort of perspective uh, and uh, so so I was wondering what, what is one or two books that that's impacted you very deeply uh, and uh, yeah what yeah what are those books like because I, I, I'm interested to know I am hoping that the most impactful books that I'm that, are go, uh, that I'm going to have in my life are, in, are still ahead of me um, you know I'm yet to read them I hope I'm hoping that is the case but uh, in my life so far, if I had to probably pick a book, one would be Atomic Habits. I think that would be uh, among the top books for me, uh, simply because of the uh, you know it has it has enabled Project Fifty Two also because I based off uh, you know based off of Atomic Habits, I built Project Fifty Two, and my whole habit building approach is influenced heavily from Project Fifty Two. Um, sorry, from Atomic Habits, and um, uh, that would be one. Another very impactful book that I've read, uh, you know, so I'll give you three books. All right? Obviously, I, I can give you a dozen recommendations, but I'll go with, with three books. Uh, so Atomic Habits is one that was what started my Project 52 journey. And uh, for, uh, for the first year of Project 52, I, as I said, my intention was to uh, cultivate uh, or rather set up a foundation for physical, mental and spiritual well-being. And uh, the book that uh, I read at that time uh, which was, uh, it was called Breath by James Nestor. And uh, this book was essentially 300 pages about the breath, right? And it was easily one of the most fascinating and incredibly uh, transformative books I've ever read. Like it was, it was, it was absolutely, it was, first of all, it's really well written and uh, very interesting to just read, but also just the facts that are there in the book are mind blowing. It'll just transform the way you think about your own simple act of breathing. Right. So that's the second book. I would highly recommend that no matter who you are, just pick up the book because breathing is something we all do. And, you know, we should we should learn about it because it's also the foundation for all three. You know, it's the foundation for physical, mental and spiritual health. I think the breath. Um, Yeah. So that's the second book. Uh, The third book would be um, it's something that I'm still reading. I'm uh, almost halfway through this book. And I can already tell you that it's probably the most one of the most important books I've read in my life. It's called um, uh, The Body Keeps the Score 
which is a, it's a book about trauma and it's not a book that you can approach lightly it's a very heavy book uh, you know it's it's not it's not an easy read it's difficult not just because of the material but because there are a lot of incidents of a lot of triggering and traumatic incidents narrated in the book as a part of you know helping us understand trauma better and how to treat trauma better uh, the book is written by uh, basil van der kolk i think that's his name yes and uh, he he was somebody who was there even before the diagnosis of ptsd post traumatic stress was even created like he was there in that field he started you know looking at the stuff like he started looking at uh, uh, trauma even before the di- di- designation of the or diagnosis of ptsd was created so uh, he's seen, he's seen it all in a way like and he's considered one of the along with probably, probably uh, dr gabo mate he's considered one of the you know original gangsters of uh, trauma research i would say um and uh, yeah the the book is so important i think because it tells us really the you know it's it's a well um it shows us how how much suffering there is in the world right and uh, it also shows us how resilient and incredible human beings are to have to you know go through that suffering and to thrive despite of that suffering and through that suffering right um yeah i think that is why i think that's a, it's a, it's an incredible book nice nice i mean we've talked about a lot of things throughout the entirety of the podcast and uh, a lot of things were heavy a lot of things were worth thinking about and i think we'll end the podcast on that note uh i want okay. to thank again the audience for coming and joining along like i said i will leave all of uh, frank's work in the description below and if you are interested in project 52 yourself you want to give it a try i highly re- i suggest that you either get back to me or frank and uh, we can again guide you through the entire process uh but uh, thank you frank for once again coming on the podcast but before we leave is there anything that you want to le- leave the audience with um do your bit to engineer paradise or not i think that would be um that would be a good message and the place to start is by you know by looking at yourself and uh, building yourself up the moment you do that uh, everything else will start falling in place perfect perfect uh so like i said thank you guys for joining in consider subscribing if you like the content over here and i will see you all in the next episode so thank you and uh, bye all right bye bye